Agriculture, Rural Development, Policy and Finance Committee to order. Uh, members of quorum is present. Uh, I know some committees go through roll call, but um, just for the record, we're noting that we have quorum. Uh, members, uh, we're gonna be uh, getting to know uh, members of the Board of Animal Health uh, better today uh, as part of our role as the Ag Committee, but also uh, constitutionally under the constitutional provisions uh, and responsibilities of the Senate is conf confirming uh, appointed members to the board, as well as other uh, positions in the executive branch. And this is an opportunity for us to uh, get to know those appointed appointees that uh, serve in the role that we ask them to serve in uh, for those intended purposes uh, on certain boards and uh, under our purview, of course, is the Ag Commissioner, but also the Board of Animal Health. And so uh, we're taking this opportunity to get to know those members better today and for you to ask questions and uh, uh, find out more how, how, they op how their, their operations or their, uh, uh, what they can contribute to the board, but also uh, more about the board uh, because we do fund them. We want them to uh, do work well and uh, We've had a lot of attention to the Board of Animal Health, this committee, and um, that's a good, because some years it's harder to delegate or spread ourselves into all the different areas we cover. Uh, but this is an important, important matter in uh, livestock, and sometimes we may not realize what all goes into the agriculture and especially livestock uh, with the Board of Animal Health and what we have in this state. So I think it's, it's good for all of us. But members, before we call uh, some of the members to, to uh, tell us about themselves and uh, meet them. Uh, uh, Senator Eakin, I um, understand uh, you had a tragic loss in your family recently, and I just want to uh, extend on behalf of myself and uh, our Ag Committee our condolences and our uh, prayers and sympathies uh, to you and your family uh, with the uh, uh, tragic loss of, of your brother. So uh, just wanted to mention that and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you so uh well th thank you so much uh, mr chair i really appreciate that uh, it means a lot to me and uh, uh and thanks to everybody who's reached out during this difficult time uh, again i uh, really appreciate it so thank you so much chair westrom i i really appreciate you bringing you, you reaching out today uh, you're welcome and uh we'll we'll keep you in our prayers thank you members uh First of all, uh, uh, first on our list is uh, Dean Comparts, uh, one of the appointed members uh, by Governor Walls to the uh, Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dean cannot join us today, uh, but as you'll see on the agenda uh, noted, uh, he was up before us last July 6th uh, for the Ag Committee and uh, the confirmation uh, uh, overview we did with him. And uh, he did want me to extend uh, his greetings to our committee and uh, also uh, tell you why he's not able to make it. Uh, members, he's uh, a pork producer, as you recall, uh, and they are uh, literally and actively uh, taking blood samples of, of their pigs that are going uh, for market or to, to be sold, uh, but to be sold overseas, they have to go through uh, blood tests and, and other uh, uh, other uh, steps to uh, prepare those pigs for market. And so uh, he was gonna be uh, needed elsewhere today. Uh, we told him we would uh, share that with the committee, uh, but he did uh, reach out to us uh, being we've heard from him before. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, he won't be able to join us because uh, he's uh, in the pig pen, so to speak. Um, members, uh, next uh, we've got, um, I've tried to work around schedules. Uh, everybody's busy. Uh, and so we're uh, starting with uh, next uh, Dr. Jessica uh, Fox. Um, and so uh, are you on uh, with us, Dr. Fox?
Okay, members, uh, we'll try to uh, make sure Dr. Fox can get us joined in here. Uh, while, while we're doing that, the staff can try to make those contacts to make sure we're not having technical difficulties. Uh, we'll move to the second on the agenda, veterinarian uh, of the veterinarians that we're looking at. Uh, Dr. Fox was one of them and Dr. Hawk, Hawkins, Peggy Hawkins. Hawkins. Uh, why don't we uh, move to you, uh, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, if you're with us, uh, where, where do you uh, zoom in from today, uh, Dr. Hawkins? Okay. So uh, Dr. Peggy Ann Hawkins, I'm zooming in from Northfield, Minnesota. Well, welcome, Dr. Hawkins. Um, uh, we uh, appreciate you taking time. I know you've got some uh, other schedules in the office there. Uh, so um, welcome to our committee. And um, as part of our getting to know you and uh, what what's the Board of Animal Health does and uh, uh, all the aspects that, that you as members have to look at, uh, we'd like to just get to know you better. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your uh, practice or your employment. and. Uh, uh, and then we'll have members that might have questions. So uh, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, go ahead and tell us, tell us about yourself and your background. Thank you. So I am a doctor of veterinary medicine, of course, and I've been practicing in Minnesota for 14 years, but I graduated, um, what was that, 30 years ago, something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I started out, uh, grew up in Iowa, which explains the pigs, but I was a town girl. Um, uh, from there, I became a vet technician, which is kind of important uh, because that's why I decided to do livestock and not do um, companion animals, not be a companion animal veterinarian. So my forte is pigs. Pigs are what I know. The other thing that made that decision, I was in the Peace Corps for three years between undergraduate at Iowa State University and getting into veterinary college. And so feeding people was a little higher on my um, list of things to do as opposed to just small animal. Um, however, I do have small animal experience. Um, uh, certainly as a veterinary technician, uh, it was very, very much of that. But as a veterinarian, uh, I took all of the courses, including uh, small animals, mixed animal uh, emphasis. So I do have that as well. Um, the Peace Corps, like I say, was a big influence on me. From veterinary college, I had an opportunity uh, to do a master's degree program with Dr. Lauren Christian. Any of you familiar with agriculture uh, will remember that name. I did a master's degree in livestock production. So uh, with that, I worked for White Oak Mills out in Pennsylvania, a, a large integrator. Um, there were 20,000 sows, which was really big at the time in the 1990s, but uh, today it's not so many. Uh, from there, I worked with Pfizer Animal Health. And with Pfizer Animal Health, eventually I moved to New York City and traveled the world talking about respiratory diseases in pigs, uh, disease management, disease prevention, uh, mostly Latin America and um, Asia, and had just started doing European when um, uh, they downsized the company and thought they didn't need technical veterinarians in New York anymore. So uh, from there, I went to um, St. Louis and worked for uh, Monsanto Choice Genetics. It was a, a swine breeding company uh, spinoff from the DeKalb uh, corn breeding and DeKalb swine breeding. Uh, if any, any of those names are ringing a bell with you, then you've been in the industry, similar industry uh, for a long time. Um, from there, I had an opportunity to work with some researchers up in Wisconsin, and I did that, but kind of became a, a burden to their finances to have a veterinarian on staff. So Dr. Mike Strobel here in, in, in Northfield, Minnesota, a swine veterinarian who I've known through the years, through many years, um, asked me to stop by and see what I thought about going back into practice. It's not common for somebody to go from in industry back into practice and it's, it's frightening. So I decided to do the scary thing, and that was 
get back in practice and I was licensed in Iowa and Wisconsin. Now I was licensed in Minnesota. I also became licensed in the Dakotas, North and South Dakota. So as you know, swine veterinarians tend to um, have to travel a lot. Uh, 256,000 miles on my pickup truck out later, um, I've, I've, um, I guess I'm just a rural veterinarian in Northfield, Minnesota. Today, however, uh, Mike Strobel and Mark Werner bought a, brought, built a manufacturing plant to manufacture livestock pharmaceuticals, and they needed a microbiologist. Turns out that being a veterinary technician in the 1970s um, really helped towards understanding microbiology because the veterinary cl clinics did it themselves at that time. So today I'm getting close to retirement and um, mostly I'm working in the microbiology lab at Aurora Pharmaceutical with uh, just a few uh, hog barns outside of town uh, and a lot of goats. Uh, I take care of a lot of goats and that's pretty much my practice now. So I'm still fully licensed. I still have livestock um, that I oversee, but I'm also overseeing the um, microbiology of Aurora Pharmaceutical. And that's me. Okay. Uh, very very, very uh, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, nice, nice to get to know uh, that history and uh, mm. uh, the array of uh, background and knowledge and uh, what you currently do to uh, also, uh, how, how do you think that plays into your position on the Board of Animal Health, if I can ask the first question and then members uh, mm -hmm. might have some questions. If you have questions, members let Joel know. Well, certainly the Board of Animal Health um, deals with livestock and uh, especially my travels overseas in Europe and seeing some of the restrictions that have been put on farmers in other countries and in other situations. Um, I can see where the Board of Animal Health needs somebody with practical experience and understanding uh, the industry. Uh, my bachelor's degree was in animal science and that was in the 1980s and seeing what hog farmers went through there, uh, first time I realized you could raise a pig and then sell it for nothing. Um, and when those things happen, you got to look at what's what's going on. And, and I think being on the Board of Animal Health uh, with my practical experience, I also was on a committee in, uh, um, in the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, called the uh, in, uh, Environmental Committee on Environmental Issues and served as a swine representative there. And I know what it is to take difficult issues that some folks are very passionate about and try to see their point of view and then try to bring it back to practicality. And um, we eat pigs. <laughs> and there are some people who uh, are even veterinarians who don't, don't understand uh, how we raise them and what we do and how important it is that uh, you have somebody who understands that. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, no, I. Um, that, that's helpful, very helpful. Members, uh, questions? Uh, Senator Anderson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know which microphone to speak into. There's one on either side of me, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Hawkins, uh, appreciate your being here today and explaining a little bit about your background. Uh, the uh, economic value of your uh, being involved with uh, Aurora Pharmaceutical, I see you've got a list of many different uh, areas that you are involved with as far as pork producers, show pigs for meat and milk or meat and milk type goats. What, what other economic uh, interests besides that there that uh, you're involved with? Dr. Hawkins. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not Fanny. quite sure I understand the, the question. Certainly I understand the economic value to Minnesota being the second largest pork producer state in the, in the union. Um, 
as far as beef cattle go, I actually do have one beef cattle uh, client and I've had many through the years. Mostly, uh, um, what do I wanna say? Uh, um, uh, the word's escaping me right now, but uh, just beef cattle, uh, not so much dairy. Dairy is very specific and you really need to know what you're doing on a, on a dairy farm. So the, the few dairy farms I've, I've dealt with has, have been on because they couldn't get somebody else at that moment. Um, I've um, preg checked the number of cattle. Uh, I don't call it my strength. And so I guess I don't feel comfortable putting it on a resume. Um, but- Mr. Uh, Senator Anderson, follow up. Mr. Chair, you, you, you're not well-versed in the dairy area uh, and why meat and, and milk type goats and that why not include sheep in, in that same category oh, just because uh Dr. there Hawkins? are no yeah there are no sheep around here okay um i would i would do sheep i suppose i've done a couple of sheep a little some show sheep um again putting that on a resume makes it sound like oh i know everything there is to know about sheep and all types of sheep and <laughs> and <laughs> um so i i guess maybe i'm Today's resumes, you put everything down that you've ever done, you know, and that's not something I'm comfortable doing. I've done quite a few horses as well. Um, I haven't found a horse I couldn't get blood from, even the ones that wanted to kill you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Or Senator Anderson, any further follow? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, Dr. Hawkins, just to, to Senator Anderson's first question, the Aurora Pharmaceutical uh, that's that is that the on your economic interest form that's the company you were talking about that you work for work with now uh, i think in your testimony if you make that, connect connect make the connections that, that's correct um there's another side of the business called uh called veterinary provisions which is a little more of the veterinary side and okay. i was i was working for veterinary provisions but now since more of the work that I do is at Aurora Pharmaceutical, they needed to pay me from Aurora. So, so that's where I, I get my money, most of my money from now is through Aurora. Um, but I was employed by uh, veterinary provisions, which was the veterinary side. Very, and, very good. Yeah. Any other questions, members? Dr. Hawkins, um, uh, we really, Thank you for uh, taking time out of your uh, pr busy practice to, today or uh, schedule and um, joining us uh, to get to know you and the other board members a little bit better. Uh, thank you for your service. And um, we have no further questions at this time. So uh, we'll uh, move back uh, to Dr. Fox. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Hawkins. Okay, thank you. And thank you for all that you guys do as well. So, bye. You're, you're sure welcome, uh, thank you. Uh, members, uh, we did connect with uh, Dr. Fox. Uh, she was tied up on a phone call uh, in her office, as I understand. But uh, Dr. Fox, are you uh, uh, with us? Uh, I am. You can are. You, can you hear Very, me okay? You, we, we can, uh, maybe just slightly closer if by chance, but we can hear you pretty well. So Okay. Um, and Dr. Uh, Fox, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, the Agriculture Committee has uh, oversight on confirmations and appointments uh, by the executive branch uh, through the Senate, uh, authorities delegated uh, through the Constitution to the Senate specifically, and uh, this is under the Agriculture Committee purview. So uh, it is part of uh, confirming uh, members and uh, getting to know them. We wanted to uh, uh, have the committee get to know you better and uh, uh, what you do and your background and uh, your service on the Board of Animal Health. So we thank you for taking the time and um, just uh, just to kick it off, uh, uh, Dr. Fox, uh, where are you zooming in from today? And uh, tell us a little about yourself and uh, your background and practice and uh, uh, what you'd like the committee to know. Okay, I'm in Marshall, Minnesota. So Lyon County, Southwest Minnesota. I am uh, licensed in both Minnesota and South Dakota. I uh, work for a company called RALCO. We do um, natural feed additives as well as nutrition for livestock. Um, we are an international company, so I was on a call with 
Columbia and having to uh, translate um, in South, <laughs> South America took, took a little bit longer than anticipated. So we have distributors all around the world and it just got me tied up a little bit. So I'm really sorry about that, that it took a little longer than anticipated. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I grew up in Minneota, Minnesota and uh, shadowed with Scott Josephson um, in Taunton, Minnesota. So even smaller yet, right? Um, since uh, he was very gracious with me since I was little. So it was mixed animal practice, um, passed me on to a new graduate veterinarian when he graduated and uh, shadowed with him until um, I got in got into veterinary school. So um, I have very mixed interests. I, I really am passionate about all animals. Um, right now with Relco, what I do is um, I work with poultry, I work with dairy cattle, beef cattle, we do some with small ruminants, um, swine is big, show pigs are big, um, and then I'm actually specially tra trained in aquaculture, and so I um, I found one other shrimp vet once, but she has now passed away. So as far as I know, I'm the only shrimp veterinarian that I can find anywhere uh, domestically. Uh, so that's kind of something unique about me. Uh, so I treat everything from very small invertebrates all, all the way up to horses. And I'm passionate about companion animals um, and, and preventative health you know, through, through nutrition, both for livestock as well as companion animals and how that can really help to prevent disease if we provide healthy diets, you know, to animals as, as they're growing, just like with us. Um, I also have a practice on the, the side, and I um, consult with different aquaculture producers, as well as backyard poultry, um, and then some companion animals as well. So again, I have pretty wide wide interests and um, really uh, passionate about the practice of medicine and um, really I'm wrapping up my master's in public health so I'm a strong believer in, in one health and working with environmental health, human health, and animal health and making sure that um, we're all working synergistically for the health of everyone. I think does is any, anybody have more questions? Or? Yeah, no, no. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Fox. Just good to get to know your background and uh, where you know where where you're at uh, currently, but 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 the background that's led you there uh, to your practice and uh, uh, pretty interesting to be likely the only uh, aquaculture vet in the state and country, if I heard you right. Uh, well, so there are other aquaculture vets that see see fish and other things, but um, for shrimp in particular, <laughs> um, I'm, as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only one uh, who works with those. If I'm wrong, please call me. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, <laughs> no. that's, that's unique. Uh, uh -huh. I just, I, I'm going through my mind is uh, how, how do you even work on it? <laughs> On a shrimp, they're so yeah, small. Yeah, they are uh, very small. <laughs> yep, babies through you a must microscope. Must have tiny fingers. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I do. <laughs> oh. So, Dr. Fox, and uh, just a, a little, little along the light humor. Um, I caught that you're from Minneota. Minneota, uh, they, Minnesota. They short yep. of S's that day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they say Minneota, Minnesota. That's the place yeah. you want to go to. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> oh. They always had a dynasty of good football and athletic teams. Mm -hmm, so, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, members, are questions? Uh, other questions? Uh, Senator Dames, uh, I think uh, Dr. Fox is in your district as a constituent. So uh, let's start correct. with you. That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome to the Ag Committee, Dr. Fox. Certainly appreciate your being here. Appreciate your serving on the Veterinarians Board, Board of Animal Health, I should say, as a veterinarian. And it's my understanding that you are the Director of the Services and Biosecurity for RALCO, is that correct? That's correct. And are you, do you work for both the nutrition side then and the shrimp side? Uh, so previously, uh, oh, sorry about that, <laughs> Senator. Um, when, when they were together, um, yes. So fi I was 50% with True Shrimp and 50% with Ralco. So I had worked with Ralco for many years before. Um, mm -hmm. So when they became their own entity, um, then I stayed um, with the parent company, uh, Ralco. So, you know, they do still call me if they, if they have 
you know, have the need, but um, I, I helped them set up an animal health and a biosecurity plan. And then um, I did stay with, with the uh, parent company, Ralco. Thank you. Dr. Senator Dames, any follow-up? Uh, thank you. No, very good. Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Fox, I, I was reading your bio and, and uh, in here it states that you're chair of the Minnesota VMA Opioid Task Force. Could you elaborate more on what uh, your task force is doing, please? Sure. Dr. Fox. Uh, I, I did it again. I'm sorry, Senator. No, no problem. <laughs> um, so um, that's it. with my master's in, in public health, I actually worked with uh, folks from Minnesota Department of Health, the MVMA, um, the, the Board of Veterinary Medicine, Board of Pharmacy, and, and we developed a survey of Minnesota veterinarians um, to uh, just talk about uh, prescribing practices and um, as well as, you know, storage and, and how they're advising people and how they feel about education. It was a very broad survey. Um, so that's how I, I got interested. And, and when I go in, I go all in, right? Um, so I really wanted to learn the history of the opioid crisis. And, and through that, uh, I joined the opioid task force. And then when the previous chair um, he actually moved uh, to a, another state. Uh, I, I started, uh, took over that committee. And uh, with that committee, we really are right now focusing on creating um, some education modules, like a certificate program for veterinarians to educate them about why preventing diversion is important. So even if we're a small piece of the puzzle, what we can control, right? I'm just, and, and also understanding if, if you see something in your clients, if you see something in your, in your staff and in your colleagues, um, what resources for what to do and how to recognize that and just really prevent um, diversion. So that's, that's our focus. Follow up, Senator Goggin. Any, uh, any no, questions? Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Okay. Members, any other questions uh, for Dr. Fox? Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Fox, uh, it says in the, your op the uh, opening statement, I think third paragraph, it talks about aquatic animal species. And I'm very interested when, you, when I start hearing about aquatic species, I also put in the word instead of animal, I would put in there myself, because I'm dealing with different lakes in my territory, invasive species. And I'm wondering, do you get involved with anything like that as far as aquatic animals, such as the shrimp or other species uh, with the invasive species in your work on a daily basis? Very good question. The Senator, or Dr. Fox? Yeah, so uh, Any response to Senator Anderson? Yeah, so not uh, not really. So when uh, the True Shrimp, when we were first getting going, uh, we worked closely with the DNR and talked about the risks and that the, the shrimp really, they need salt water, they need warm temperatures, you know, so just talking, working with the DNR to understand the risk of bringing shrimp into Minnesota and if they could potentially become, which, which they can't. Um, so other than encouraging people to wash their boats before they go into other other lakes, uh, I'm not directly involved with invasive species in, in my day-to-day -day work. Very good. Uh, other questions, members? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions, members? So, so Dr. Fox, just uh, refresh me. How long have you worked kind of on the aquatic, aquatic side and it sounded like you you uh, do some uh, some side practice on uh, small animals and and a, f and a few others, but before that, uh, re remind me. I guess I I don't uh, recall your your practice before that was more in veterinary, and then you've you moved into the specializing in the shrimp or the aquatic side of things. But just re recap that for me, if you could, please. Sure. So I I kind of have a convoluted background, <laughs> but um, I've actually worked in research and development on the human food side, and then that's kind of how I transitioned. And that was just while I was you know waiting to get into vet school, and then during that time I also you know started working for for Ralco in their research and development, and then um, as I got accepted into veterinary school, I continued to have projects that I worked on 
you know, while working for RELCO and going to veterinary school. Um, so I, I always knew that I wanted to do aquatic medicine. I got very frustrated. I've always had aquariums and I couldn't find veterinarians that would treat my fish, right? And I was like, there has to be a way that I don't have to, you know, if I see something happening that I can, that I can help. And I also love whales and manatees and dolphins and, and conservation work. I'm, I just think all that stuff is awesome. So I wanted to get trained in that in addition to just the regular veterinary path and was able to shadow with Amy Kaiser, who is an aquatic veterinarian here in Minnesota. She's the veterinarian for Sea Life Aquarium. And through that, she encouraged me to do AquaVet program. And so since then, I did, I've done, um, that's through Cornell University. So I have lots of aquatic training. I've done aquatic um, AquaVet one, two, and three, um, and worked with everything from invertebrates to fish to aquarium fish to dolphins and, and uh, stingrays. And so um, whenever I'm in Mexico, I actually go down and, and spend a day with the, the dolphinarium there and <laughs> try to keep up my skills, skills with that. And I, I work with an aquarium now that I consult with and get to do uh, fish medicine, turtle medicine, and you know, st stingrays, which is awesome. Um, but so really, um, my training started uh, with aquatics in probably 2014. I did some stuff um, with Nick Phelps. He, he did um, some stuff with the club for people who were interested in, in vet school. And then um, just have continued to train and build on that aquatic knowledge since. Very good. And uh, last question from me. Uh, just, just talk to us about how that connects with your uh, duties and uh, your contributions to the Board of Animal Health, uh, if you could, please. The uh, aquatics in general? No, just your, just your general background, I guess, okay. uh, connecting <laughs> it to the Board of Animal Health. Just just give us your observation uh, and how that helps you uh, as, as one of the Board of Animal Health members in uh, fulfilling those duties and responsibilities. Sure. So I think just with the diversity of species that... Um, I have some knowledge in and then lots of contacts to call in if, if I need call on if I need to have more, you know, more information. Um, but I've, I've been exposed to a wide variety of things and I'm passionate about protecting our food supply and agriculture in Minnesota. Um, aquaculture is, is a priority, you know, domestically because it's actually our uh, second largest trade deficit besides oil. So it's very important that we grow aquaculture domestically. Uh, so I, I hope to, if there's any questions with that, support that in Minnesota um, and, and any questions that, that there are. I re really am passionate about taking complicated subjects and, and breaking them down to be more understandable. So I do that with, with producers for, for our customers, as well as you know, the different staff that I work with. I work with I'm the only veterinarian at RELCO, so I work with, with nutritionists to, you know, the VPs and the executive staff. I have worked with human resources during COVID to uh, design our, our protection uh, protocols at, at RELCO and communicate those to the staff and, and why those are so important. And, um, you know, so really just communicating on diverse teams and understanding everyone's perspectives and, and trying to come up with the solution that's good for the health of everybody. Very good, very good. Uh, members, uh, no la any last questions? Otherwise, uh, I think that covers it. No, no further questions, uh, Dr. Fox. Uh, uh, we just want to thank you again for uh, making time uh, to join us. Uh, thank you for uh, for for, for uh, your input and uh, getting us being able to get to know you a little bit better. So, uh, thank you for for your service. Thank you for inviting me. You have a great day. Members, um, we've got two more, two more uh, members that we're going to move to. Um, uh, next uh, would be uh, Erica Swatsky. Uh, Erica, uh, being from uh, west, Western Minnesota, uh, also happens to be my Senate district. Uh, Erica, are you with us? Uh, welcome. Thank you, Chair Westrom. Can everybody hear me? We, we can. We can. Uh, uh, Erica, uh, welcome to our Agriculture Committee. Uh, you've probably seen uh, before uh, testifiers um, consistent with our uh, uh, authority under the Constitution and uh, in the Senate. Uh, 
uh, oversight and consent to, or consent and oversight to uh, um, appointments to the executive branch. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, members, uh, we did note on the agenda, uh, the current status, uh, Erica is a board member. Uh, her term has recently expired, uh, subject to uh, any uh, reappointment, uh, but we wanna get to know the board members uh, as part of this uh, process as well. And uh, Erica, uh, we'll go to you and uh, tell us about yourself, your background, and uh, uh, get it, to let us get to know you a little bit better uh, uh, as well. And uh, I, uh, I appreciate you uh, joining us from, uh, I hear snowy Western Minnesota right now. So uh, where, do, where do you zoom in from, uh, Erica? Thank you, Chair Westrom. Um, I am zooming in from Kensington um, today and it is in your neck of the woods. So I don't know what the weather's like in St. Paul, but I'm certainly um, thankful that I was able to zoom in here virtually instead of trying to drive down because it's not pretty outside. So well, well, well welcome and uh, tell us about yourself and your background and uh, your involvement with agriculture. And uh, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to get to know more about uh, you as uh, one of the appointed members of the board. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Westrom. Um, my name is Erica Swatsky and I'm a sixth generation turkey corn and soybean farmer. Um, I got my undergrad in animal science at NDSU, uh, North Dakota State University up in Fargo. When I was first appointed to the board, uh, my family and I were raising turkey breeders. Uh, what that means is we would get one day old poults, which are baby turkeys, um, and raise them through a full lay cycle. Um, when, when, when they start to lay eggs, they're about uh, 30 uh, weeks of age. So the, the lifespan of those hens on our farm is um, total about a year and a half. Um, <clears throat> annually, we would produce about 1.2 million eggs. Um, the eggs that, that uh, they laid and that were produced on our farm, we sold to a hatchery where they would be hatched and sold to farmers who were raising market turkeys. Um, in January of 2020, we actually started raising market turkeys as a grower partner for Ferndale Market, which is located in Cannon Falls. They are a multi-generational family raising turkeys like us who are incredibly unique in that they have their very own um, re retail store on their farm to sell their uh, turkey products. Um, we now are raising uh, light hens. We produce about 1.8 million pounds um, per year of turkey. And so those hens um, are on our farm for about three months. So our, you know, the lifespan of the hens that we have now are a lot shorter than what we used to have when we had turkey breeders. Um, this operational change to our farm came with changes within the turkey breeder industry, a family farm transition within our family and our business, and a severe labor shortage um, kind of across the board, all of, across all of agriculture. Uh, a turkey breeder farm is not like, uh, it's a lot like a dairy farm. Um, if anybody's familiar with that, help is needed um, every day uh, for the full length of the day, even on the weekends and during blizzards. Um, prior to moving home to farm with my family, I worked for the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association. While working for the turkey growers, I really got a chance to understand um, how the Board of Animal Health really functioned overall and not just specifically to my family farm. Uh, in 2015, when high pathogenic avian influenza devastated our industry, I really got a firsthand glimpse into the response efforts to combat um, the disease by the board. And now um, being a board member, that's really allowed me just to have a bigger role within the industry while wearing my farmer hat. Um, I've always believed that as a farmer, you should see more than your mailbox, you know, be, be involved in things off your farm um, and be part of the discussion. And being a board member has really provided me that opportunity within, um, uh, within agriculture and, and given me the opportunity to discuss how we farm, but also learn about a lot of other sectors within agriculture. Um, <clears throat> I've been very fortunate to have served in this role, um, really in more ways than one, you know, has helped my family and now our other grower partners navigate through some tough um, decisions. Um, that's about all I have. Thank you, uh, Chair Western, for the time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. 
Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Erica. And uh, Senator Dornick has a question. Senator thank Dornick. You. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to thank you for your work, Ms. Swatsky, uh, for the service you are to the board. And uh, a question I have is uh, I just really appreciate the history of our parents and grandparents in the farm. And I see it's been a long history. I'd like to hear a little bit about that, uh, uh, how the farm started and maybe what else you produced. And um, so, yeah, if you could ask. Mrs. That. Swatsky. Yeah, um, thank you for asking about that. My family farm, we actually have a lot of history. Um, my great, great, great grandfather immigrated um, in 1848 from Norway, and he actually um, settled in Wisconsin first, and then fought in the Civil War, and um, was was discharged from the Civil War. And when he went back to um, Wisconsin, um, that was the during the Homestead Act, and so um, he had I think it was 60 acres in Wisconsin, and because of the Homestead Act, you know that amount of land was doubled that you could get for free. So he moved west and settled um, on our farm where we're currently at in 1866. And um, and so we've, we've, we've been here since, you know, obviously back in that day, uh, as a farmer, I mean, you had everything, you know, you had your own dairy cows, beef cows, you know, all of that. But um, it was in the early 1900s that my, so it'd be his daughter, my great great grandmother started raising um, turkeys as a supplemental income for her family. Um, at that time, uh, it was seasonal. So she would hatch out her own turkeys in the spring, um, raise them through the summer. And then in the fall, she would butcher her own turkeys, you know, and then sell them, br bring them to town and, and sell them. And that was her income. Um, each kind of generation since then just really enjoyed the turkeys and expanded the the farm you know and expanded that turkey um and so uh when i was growing up um we also had uh beef cows um along with turkeys and uh i think it was like the mid mid to late 90s we got rid of the the beef cows um it just beef cows took more time than what my family could give. Uh, the turkey breeders, um, like I said, I mean, there's a lot of labor, um, you know, in that picking those eggs. Um, hens need to be artificially inseminated once a week to produce fertilized eggs. Um, so it's, it's pretty labor intensive. So, um, you know, we got rid of the beef cows. When my dad was growing up, we had breeders and market turkeys, they had both. From a biosecurity standpoint, they made the decision to focus solely on turkey breeders. So hopefully that answered. Do you have any more questions? Very good. <laughs> Senator uh, Dornick, any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, so, Senator Dornick. You had mentioned labor shortage. Uh, what kind of uh, labor sort or amount of people do you need to run your farm? And uh, is it mostly family or is it kind of both? Ms. Swatsky, um, did you hear the question? I did, yeah, thank you. Um, when we were breeders, we had anywhere from probably 15 to 20 employees. Um, not all of those employees were uh, full-time. You know, we, we had a lot of part-time um, employees, but really, um, you know, between me and my family and then a couple of full-time um, employees that picked eggs during the week, every day, Monday through Friday, um, you know, we had part-time um, kids, mostly high school kids, who would pick eggs on the weekend. And then we also had uh, part-time people who would help us um, artificially in inseminate um, our hens, which was done once a week. Uh, <clears throat> now raising market turkeys, it's myself, um, my father, and then I have one full-time employee. Um, <clears throat> there's certain days during the year uh, so I raise about uh, eight flocks a year. Every time that I get baby turkeys or that I have a flock um, that we're loading out to go to market, I do need um, some more people. So those are just, um, you know, part-time uh, people kind of from the community who come to help and, and enjoy it. And it's, I don't need them every day and they're okay with that. So 
Any follow-up, Senator Dornick? Uh, last question. I know you'd mentioned the Go ahead, and then Senator Anderson has a question. Mr. Chair, uh, last question. The avian influenza that you talked about in 2015, I was just wondering how you guys fared in that or um, or when you started that down. I don't remember, was that, did you, were you going through that as a producer or just uh, go, talking about the, the uh, in general, when you had mentioned that? Ms. Swatsky? So in 2015, um, I was working for the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association. So I wasn't at home on the farm every day, but I was home. Um, and so that office is located in Buffalo. So that's about two hours from where our farm is. A lot of weekends I would be at home helping out. So I was a full-time employee with the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association, um, but certainly still involved in my family farm. So um, we did not get um, high path avian influenza. We did have a scare on our farm. Um, at that time in 2015, um, we had been raising our own toms to provide us um, semen to artificially inseminate all of our hens. Um, I, on a quick side note, it, uh, Tom semen has to be fresh. You can't freeze it. Um, like, like you can with, um, with cattle semen. So, uh, so anyway, in 2015, um, at that point we were getting, um, Tom semen from a stud farm out in Wilmer. They were testing, you know, that flock, um, uh, every day that they would collect semen. They had gotten a false positive. <clears throat> Uh, the morning after the, the same day that they provided us that semen, uh, they didn't know it was a false positive. So they called us and said, Hey, we gave you tainted semen. I think you need to kill all of your hens. And um, for us, you know, that was a knee jerk reaction. And so you, we wouldn't have taken those measures. And uh, because I worked at the uh, Minnesota Turkey Growers Association um, and had worked closely with the Board of Animal Health. I mean, I knew the process that um, you need to have an auditor come out um, and, and look at everything. I mean, you need to have official testing done. You, so I knew all of that process. Um, and so we said, no, you need to retest your Tom flock, please, and then get back to us. And they did, and it was a false positive. So we ended up being fine, but definitely, you know, very um, scary times. And when somebody tells you, you know, um, your hen, your entire flock may die. I mean, that's um, especially when you're when we've been in business this long, um, that's really disheartening. And it, it just makes you almost sick. Thank you. No more thank questions. you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Swatsky. Uh, Senator Anderson has a question. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Steve Olson works at the Turkey Growers Association in Buffalo, where I live, so I know him very well. I've not met you personally, but if you've been at the office, I've gone by there. I drive by there just about every day, so um, I'm glad you're in, in our neck of the woods. Thank you. Uh, but I want to ask the economic impact of your farm in relationship to, you know, Minnesota's number one in Turkey. Well, it's between Minnesota and Virginia. I know they fight back and forth as far as they want to, wants to be first, but how would you recommend or how would you uh, promote uh, your turkey farm, say for the rest of the state of Minnesota or show that this is a great asset to uh, Minnesotans from the, your vantage point? Ms. Swatsky. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Um, that's a good question. I. Uh, I grew up in 4-H and FFA and um, my, you know, my dad and my grandfather have both served on the uh, Minnesota Turkey Growers Board um, as, as producer directors. Um, my grandma back in the day, you know, she was really, really believed heavily in promoting um, the, you know, the, the state of um, or Turkey within our state. And so um, I grew up actually being in parades, promoting Turkey, um, Eat More Turkey, and um, working for the Turkey Growers. My position there, I was um, the uh, promoter and then membership coordinator. So I got a lot of opportunity to promote Turkey um, in the state of Minnesota, but then also work with our membership. Um, and so that continues on really with what I do on the farm. Um, my dad has always talked about 
you know, share what you do on the farm because nobody else knows that story. And so always talk about what you do. Um, we've been really fortunate to do a number of things. Um, 14 years ago, we had uh, Mike Rowe with Dirty Jobs out for our farm to do a show. Um, since then, you know, I've been on the board for Minnesota Egg in the classroom um, and have helped them with some of their content for their, their egg mag. Um, I, uh, last November, I saw a, a year ago, this past November, um, my dad and I did a live video um, uh, tour with a lot of classrooms that could zoom in and ask us live, you know, we were standing in a barn with our turkeys and they could ask us questions. Um, we're really close with the uh, Minnesota millennial farmer and he's done two videos um, at our farm. And so I, my husband is a high school egg teacher uh, as well. Actually, um, Terry Westrom, some of your kids have had him in class. And um, so, my, you know, even, even my husband, I mean, he talks daily about what we're doing on the farm. And if we have a flock that is sick, I mean, he talks to them about what we do. And so um, I, I guess a long answer to shorten it up, um, Representative Anderson, is I think in everything that we do in our daily lives, um, we always try and promote the turkey industry. And this past fall, we even created a um, Facebook farm page. And so we always are trying to talk about the turkey industry and share what we do on our farm um, so that people really understand what we're doing. And, you know, turkey is a, it's a good, um, healthy product to eat. Mr. Senator Chair. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, Ms. Swatsky, which do you prefer, uh, turkey bacon or turkey burger? <laughs> Ms. Swatsky, do you have a choice? <laughs> I don't know if he's really answer, looking for an answer or not. <laughs> can, can all the above. Okay. Ms. Ms. Swatsky, if you want to answer that, you can, but coupled with that, you jog my memory, and I think it'd be a kind of a interesting fact for the committee to know, uh, you talked about uh, Mike Rowe and the TV stay, uh, show uh, Dirty Jobs. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that, uh, uh, that kind of made Kensington, Minnesota uh, famous a few years back. Uh, tell us just a little bit more of a snippet of that because it's kind of a fun fact, I think. Sure. Um, well, first, <laughs> I'll add, I hope that people have heard about Kensington because of the Kensington runestone, but not everybody is a history buff like I am. But um, yeah, Micro, um, I, I think it was about 14 years ago this April, uh, Micro came out um, in, this, in this spring and it should have been a nice uh, day, but it was actually a day like today, it was during a blizzard. And um, he and his crew went in the ditch on the way out to our farm. Um, it was just, it was kind of a mess, but they finally made it out to our farm. And, um, you know, 14 years ago, we were uh, uh, in the turkey breeder uh, industry. And at that time we had our, you know, our own Tom still. So you get to see um, Mike Rowe, you know, collecting semen from our Toms and then artificial, um, artificially inseminating our hens. And um, I always tell, I always tell people that uh, what you see, of Mike Rowe on TV is truly how he is in person. Um, he's not fake. He, within the first probably hour of being at our farm, um, he had spoken to my family and I one-on-one -on -one and gotten to know our names, really gotten to know us um, and was super thankful for the, you know, the jobs that we do. I mean, it was really um, humbling. And then we did serve them, um, him and his crew lunch. And it was, it was a turkey, you know, meal, of course. And he actually dished up plates for his crew um, and served them before he ate, you know, sat down to, to eat his, his own meal. So really, um, it was a really, it was just like a fascinating experience. And uh, I know you can find the video on YouTube. They do run, um, uh, reruns on TV. I mean, I get text messages all the time from people. Hey, I, you know, I saw your farm on, um, on Dirty Dogs. So, but just really a neat opportunity to have somebody famous come to Kensington. Uh, Kensington is about 275 people. So it's pretty small town. Very, very good. Thank you, uh, Ms. Swatsky. And Senator Goggin has a question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to go back and touch on the, uh, avian flu uh, 
that you know you, you guys experienced uh, back in 2015. I know uh, we have a th potential threat coming our way. It's in Indiana right now. And I was just curious if uh, what your farm or what the Turkey Growers Association uh, has uh, set up for mitigation uh, techniques and strategies to uh, combat that before it has a potential to uh, affect any of our turkey turkey growers. Ms. Swatsky, to Senator Goggins' question, any? Yeah, that's. Um, thank you for asking that. That that's a really good question. Um, for me personally, on my farm, um, I so I have one full time uh, employee, um, and and then and then my dad. But um, with my full time employee, it's just it's kind of daily communication between between her and I. Um, she's very well aware of what's going on in Indiana. I mean, I'm very upfront with her about that. Um, we do have biosecurity. So our buyers biosecurity practices from on my farm um, from when we were breeders to now raising market turkeys hasn't changed. And so um, when, for example, when you go into our, um, into to, so all barns are set up the same, but when you go into one of our barns, uh, it's called a Danish um, entry. And I, you basically have a line of separation and most turkey farms are like this. I mean, this is pretty standard across the industry, but um, that line of separation, when you first walk into that entryway, that workroom, that's your dirty side. And so when you cross that line of separation, the, the goal is to keep everything um, on the outside of the barn that we consider dirty, so just germs there. Um, and so when I cross over that line, um, I have a different different pair of shoes on that I only wear inside the barn. And I'm, and I also put on a coverall so that my street clothes um, are covered. You know, if I have, uh, you know, some sort of like a virus on my jeans, let's say, um, the goal is that that coverall is over that um, your dirty clothes, you know, and and so that's that's kind of the, the goal there. Um, in terms of, I guess, industry, uh, Dr. Dale Lauer with the the board, he's at the poultry testing lab. Um, he does a really good job. He um, uh, leads our emergency disease management committee, and um, they used to meet once a month. Now they're meeting um, once a week, so that and and the the individuals that are on that group, they're they're people within the industry. It's about fifty of us. Um, representatives from the different poultry companies, veterinarians. Um, I'm a producer on that committee because I'm on the board of animal health. And so it's consistent, you know, weekly um, information and preparedness. Um, I know the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association is doing, so I, I can't answer for them because I don't, I mean, I don't work for them, but I know they are, um, they have a monthly um, magazine and then a, I think it's another week, uh, email that goes out to all their members. And so those sorts of publications have um, information about um, high path or biosecurity, you know, and where where can you as a grower get more information or help if you need and um, or even like your your um, testing kits for avian influenza, um, where you can get those or, you know, um, so anything, any information that you would need to have to be prepared the turkey growers really works hard to provide that and communicate that. Um, did I answer your question? Uh, Senator yes, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you did. Uh, if I could, just two more quick points, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Goggin. <clears throat> well, I, first off, I want to thank you for uh, uh, working with Ferndale Markets down in, in my district here uh, in Cannon Falls there. They've got a really great retail operation model and uh, hopefully other farmers and in, in not only in Turkey will uh, benchmark that and uh, use that as a uh, hopefully as a model to uh, uh, if they so want to do their retail uh, retail market as well and in, in their and whatever their uh, operations are. Uh, lastly, I just want to ask a kind of a personal question. Uh, if you know a gentleman by the name of Brad Sawatsky that lives out in the Pacific Northwest. I don't know if he's from Minnesota. I worked with him uh, at my other job, and I just was curious if you knew him. If you did, uh, and you 
say if you would say hi to him for me, I'd appreciate it. He was a <laughs> great guy to work with. So, uh, <laughs> Ms. Swatsky. <laughs> um, I don't. I'll have to ask my husband. So my maiden name is Nelson. So I went from a Nelson to a Swatsky, and I've I've kind of had a hard time with that. It's not. It's hard to pronounce, but I know he um he always so that our our last name ends in E, and if it's Y, I know there's no relation. Um, but I'll I'll have to ask my husband. So. Great, thank you. Yep. Any other questions, members? Looks like none. Uh, Ms. Swatsky, uh, any final comment? And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, go ahead if you have any final comment. I just thank you for your time and, and allowing me to, to introduce myself and, and share more about my farm. So that's all, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you for joining us and uh, taking time out of uh, your uh, your farming operation and uh, but not a bad day to do some office work uh, as I always say I I don't didn't, didn't don't mind office job on days like today so uh, you have a good good day and uh, I know uh, your husband's busy at the school I talk with him on other things too he's an FFA advisor member so uh, in our local school so thanks for joining us thank you members um, one more uh, we have uh, Jim Vats, uh, another appointed member to the board. And uh, Mr. Vats, are you with us? Oh, I, th I think you're muted yet. Aren't, aren't able to hear you yet, Mr. Vats. Can you hear us, Jim? But I'm. There we go. Oh, we heard for a little bit. One second, we'll work through this. Okay, Jim, I'm being told if you can try to unmute on your own. There you go. Can you, can you hear, hear me us, now? Jim? Yes, we, we do. Thank Jim, you. Uh, Mr. Vats, uh, welcome to our Ag Committee. Uh, Appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, as we uh, go through getting to know uh, members of the Board of Animal Health, uh, which is under our purview uh, per the Constitution and the authorities delegated to us here in the Senate. And uh, uh, we do appreciate you taking time to uh, uh, to share with us uh, your involvement and uh, your background, so we get to know you better as well. So, uh, Mr. Vatz, uh, where are you where are you zooming in from today? Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to. Uh, beyond today. Uh, it's another technological uh, miracle that it's all working for my benefit. But you talk about, uh, you're talking about the history. My uh, great grandfather purchased some of the land I farm in 19, 1872. And then my uh, ancestors have been farming that land ever since. And so, uh, I had an early experience with the Board of Animal Health when I was uh, 12, 13 years old during the 50s. That's when uh, they went nationwide trying to uh, uh, get, you know, get rid of TB and all the animals. And so they came to our farm in those days and we had to test all our livestock. And in those days, people didn't have shoots or corrals and shoots. So it was quite an adventure with a rodeo getting animals corralled to run them through the chute and the vet chute and uh, put the injection in and then run them through a few days later to test reactors. So I remember that vividly. It was quite a uh, interesting process on my dad's farm. We had dairy cattle and beef cows uh, even in the fifties. And so, uh, and I graduated from high school. I live in Filmer County, Southeast Minnesota. When I graduated high school, I was the first one amongst my family to go to college. I went to the University of Minnesota, graduated from there with a Bachelor of Science degree. And at that time, there was a shortage of vocational agriculture teachers. So my dad suggested I do that so I could get some money before I came back to farm. So 
I was a Moag teacher for two years, which I actually enjoyed quite a bit. But I returned to the farm. I got married and we had dairy, uh, beef cattle, uh, feeder steers, and hogs. And then as the years went by, when I had young sons, my wife decided she wanted to get an enterprise that my sons could be active in. So we had a, a flock of 150 sheep and we lambed out and we fed the lambs to market weight. So over the years, we left the dairy, but I've had 250 beef, cow, beef cows, mama cows that I calved, fed their calves out to market weight. I bought several hundred Western feeders during the years and I fed them out to market weight. And then I had a feral to finish 3,000 head hogs. So uh, previously you interviewed a couple licensed veterinarians. I am not licensed, but I have done a huge amount of vet work over the years with all these different enterprises. I've delivered many difficult births from most species. So I uh, have a lot of history in that. And so I think, uh, and then I also have had horses. I still have horses. I have horses and mules that I have used with my beef cattle and I have them for recreation also. So uh, uh, two years ago, right now, I just looked it up yesterday. It was about this exact time I was recruited by the governor to serve on the board, and I was interviewed during that time. And so I was accepted onto the board. And uh, it was, uh, I guess I assumed that I was uh, sought out because I am a, I also, in addition to being a true American farmer, I'm an avid outdoorsman, and I am a, I belong to almost every state and national wildlife organizations and conservation groups, and I've been very active in all these groups over the years. So I am also very interested and I've followed the history of CWD for the last 20 years. It's been very concerning to me. I'm pretty well educated on it. And a few years ago, I think it was more than 10 years ago, we had that outbreak of uh, TB in Northwest Minnesota. And it started out in the dairy cattle and it spread to the uh, white-tailed deer. And uh, it affected my business because I used to import uh, cattle from Western states and breeding stock and bulls. And so incidentally, I've had a long history of working very favorably with the Board of Animal Health, so I was familiar with a lot of their procedures. But I watched that scenario in Northwest carefully over the years, and or at the time, and it's kind of interesting. I think Dr. Thompson, the executive director, she worked on that project, and Michelle Carson from the DNR also was a young vet working on that project. So uh, two years ago when I got appointed, to this board, I did a lot of deep research on how that all played out. And so I interviewed a lot of the original players, including Ed Bogness, who was uh, one of the top DNR people at the time. And he gave me a lot of history. And I, I refer to that because there was a serious animal disease outbreak that had spread to the wild populations. And uh, it seemed uh, very, unlikely it would ever be eradicated. But Ed pointed out to me that at the time, the governor, the USDA, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and the Minnesota DNR all stepped in. The governor furnished the money. All the other agencies worked cooperatively together, and they totally eradicated TB in uh, domestic herds and in the wildlife population which is a gigantic success story. So after watching uh, what's been happening with CWD, I thought it's been done before. Let's see if we can accomplish that again. So that's kind of where I started out getting involved with the board. It's, uh, CWD is a very complex, horrible disease. It's very difficult to manage 
uh, no life test is a huge disadvantage, makes it very complicated. It was interesting in your meeting last week, uh, Dr. Thompson presented to this committee uh, the uh, bird influenza about uh, you have to watch the flyways of wild birds and how important that is and how risk, how to prevent risk. And uh, when I was listening to that, thinking of it after the meeting, that it came to me there's a real correlation when you compare bird influenza and CWD. Uh, bird influenza initially spread um, around the world actually by water, water, wild waterfall, and that can create serious um, presentation of the disease into our state of Minnesota. So it's going from wild to domestic. Well, you look at uh, CWD is just kind of the opposite way. It's uh, CWD showed up in Wyoming in the 60s and kind of lingered there for a long time. But it started spreading and suddenly started showing up throughout the Midwest and eventually the world. And obviously there was no uh, wild creature that decided to walk from uh, Colorado to New York or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, they traveled on the trailer. So in comparing bird uh, diseases that are uh, spread by wild creatures, CWD was initially spread mostly to domestic and then it has eventually wound up in the wild population, which is really unfortunate. So being on the board, I've been very interested in participating and seeing what I could do to help out here. Um, as soon as I got on the board, I uh, got permission from uh, Beth Thompson that I wanted to go with uh, board staff. And I, so I visited survey farms. I understand that no board member had ever done that before. I wanted to go out and uh, go through all of the procedures. And I wanted to see it firsthand, which I did the first year. And then uh, let me back up a moment, uh, I guess like five years ago before I was approached to be on the board, the uh, Board of Animal Health, there was an audit done of them uh, by the, some department from the state of Minnesota. And so I was interested in how that was gonna go. So I called up and I volunteered to come and testify. So I went to the Twin Cities and I spent several hours with an investigator and I thought I could contribute something positive to that. So I spent some time explaining to this investigator how uh, a producer of uh, animals, uh, so not survey, but uh, like my beef cows. I have a lot of experience with my 250 cow beef herd on fence management, how important good fences are, how to manage fences. I have worked extensively with my heard was uh, inventory. And so I am impressed on this investigator, the importance of an inventory control. And then I brought my tools along of how you uh, tag and how that all works out. So I brought my tagging tools along, demonstrated that to the investigator, and I explained my coding system and so on. And she seemed to be very interested and thankful for my input. So. I have been involved with- uh, Mr. Vance, if you want to get just a little closer, sometimes it seems to fade out a little and okay. I want to make sure everybody can hear you. That, Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so actually I have been very involved for the last 20 years, ever since CWD first showed up. I have gone to uh, local, statewide and national conferences, seminars on CWD. I've uh, met a lot of interesting people. I have people, uh, Dr. D'Angelo, who used to be at the Minnesota DNR, is now in Georgia. He's one of the larger university research programs. I confer with him frequently for advice. Uh, Kip Adams is the communication director for QDM and North American Whitetail Alliance in Pennsylvania. I know him well. I call him for advice to help me to deal with uh, whatever I can do on this issue. Uh, once I get onto the board, uh, I, in Fillmore County, 
that is where one of the hotspots in the whitetail herd is located, which is the core area is 14 miles from my farm. Well, uh, two years ago, a positive uh, yearling buck was harvested a mile and a half from the edge of my property. My property is in Fillmore County. I have a large acreage. I have multiple white-tailed deer on my farm that I uh, feed and nurture and I watch after and I love them being there. I care very much about their welfare. So that's partly why I'm so interested and involved here. And I realize that because of the nature of this disease, we may never eradicate it in Minnesota, but only a small portion, like less than 5% of the state is now, uh, it's now present in the wildfield herd. So my goal by working on the board is to keep as much as Minnesota disease-free for as long as possible. And maybe down the road we'll get vaccines and different things come along. But I'm seriously dedicated to do what I can to help manage this disease. So I've been honored to be on the board. I worked very hard at it. I know in the last meeting you were studying the history of the Board of Animal Health going back to 1903. And the chairman kind of joked about there was 19,000 was a budget back in, back in 1903, how that wouldn't buy much. Well, I can give you an example. I'm working very seriously. A lot of uh, a great portion of my time is spent researching, studying, and doing everything on this disease that I can, and I come free. There's no charge. And I'm doing, I'm working as hard as I can. I'm serious about it. I'm committed and dedicated. And so I guess that's my story. Thank you for your great. Very good, uh, Mr. Vats. And, and where is it you're zooming in from us, to us today from? This is in my office. I uh, am spending uh, the last uh, six weeks at my home in Arizona. Very good. And uh, talk, you, you mentioned, uh, so you're not getting snow there at least. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're not getting snow. <laughs> uh, but I keep in close contact with my sons and my friends. And I know that uh, my farm the snow is drifting north of it today, so uh, we're not. Uh, we are, I am enjoying a nice uh, Arizona day. Very good. Uh, Mr. Questions, members? Senator uh, Dames. Well, thank you, Jim, for joining us today for the Ag Committee. We do appreciate it, and thank you for laying out a lot of the things that you've done in your interest and why you're on the board. As I understand, uh, you've been put on the board as a, as a livestock producer under that category. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Vets? Yes. And so can you tell Senator me, are Dames. you currently, uh, Mr. Chair? Senator Dames. So can you tell me, Jim, are you currently involved in the production of agricultural animals? I do Mr. not. At the current time, I do not own any uh, livestock animals, except my group of uh, about a dozen horses and mules. So and, another uh, Senator question. James. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have a couple of other questions. Go ahead, Senator. So James. on your economic interest statement that you sent in when you applied to be on the board of uh, uh, the, the board, uh, it says that uh, under the business or professional activities category, it says agriculture and for forestry support activities. And it shows that you're an, that you, and then you checked employee. So can you explain what those agriculture and forestry support activities are that you're doing and if you are actually an employee of somebody or not? Mr. Vets? I took that question to mean, have, have, do I have other investments? Is that what you're talking about? No, this Sen would Senator be- Senator uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this would be activities that you're involved in not necessary, not, uh, not uh, professional investments. There was another I, category for that and that you filled out. I guess I don't remember that question. I read over my application today. I, did, I don't remember what you're asking about. Okay. 
And do you, your, the farm that you that you were farming, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. S Senator Dames. The farm that you, the, the land that you were farming, livestock you had, was that, do you have any children that took over for you or you just rent your land out and do things like that? I Mr. still Bats. actively farm my own farm. My sons were in high school in the mid eighties and we were in under financial stress. So my wife insisted that they both go to college and get real jobs, so <laughs> they did. And they have very successful jobs. They love farming. I still do all the row cropping. I had beef cows until two years ago. It ended up that I got out of it about the same time I interviewed for this job. I have 800 acres of row crop. I still market all my own grain. I harvest my own grain. I uh, just got done buying uh, $210,000 with the farm inputs. So I'm still very involved financially and physically in the ag industry. I have uh, almost 60 years of livestock experience. And I've been reading back in the history and I realize I'm an egg producer physician. I never saw the word in there active. Maybe I missed it. Mr. Senator Kirk, Dames. Well, thank you uh, for your answer. And uh, you're right, back in the 1980s, there were a lot of issues. And so I could certainly understand what happened there. So you say you're actively farming your crop land today. So are you, uh, uh, what kind of crops are you raising? And are you doing the labor yourself? Or are you custom farming it? Or how are you doing that? Mr. Vets. I raise corn, soybean, and uh, hay grown. And uh, I do actively farm. I uh, will return home and I will put in the crops. My sons help me. My grandchildren come and drive tractor. We have a great time. And I have uh, a $400,000 line of machinery. It actually is probably $600,000 now with the econ economics. But uh, I have a great time with my family farming 800 acres. My, grand, my grandson is very techy. He's 15 and he uh, he's, uh, enjoys himself in the combine because it's beyond me. And so I show up at, for work. I have a corn dryer. I run my own corn dryer. I have my own semi. And I uh, change oil in all my tractors. And uh, if the neighbor needed me to help him castrate his beef calves, I still, I, I think I still know how to do that. Well, thank I, you. I will agree I'm old, but I don't know how I haven't figured out to retire yet. Well, th well thank you. Senator Dames, any more follow-up? Uh, no, no, I have no follow-up. Senator French, uh, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Vots, for testifying today. Senator Dames is asking you about your answer and your employment status. I guess my question is, as you now understand that question and your status as a livestock producer, is that question answered incorrectly on that form? I, I still Mr. don't Betts. understand what, how the question is worded. And if I answered it incorrectly, I guess I didn't understand it at the time, but I'll have to go back. So was there a specific question that I answered? I, I, I don't remember. Could you read the question to me? Uh, Senator French, you want to point to that? Mr. Chair, I appreciate the way Senator Dames raised it. I guess if Senator Dames wants to read it, our point is okay. that it's a livestock Good. producer position. And I think the board and the committee would want to know if the information provided is accurate. And if it's not, uh, we can correct the record here. Uh, and I don't mean sure. to suggest Senator Dames has a language in front of him, but if he does, I think it'd be worth us going through real quick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Senator Dames, uh, yes, I'll go to you. From I Senator do have Prince. the, the, the uh, language in front of me. And what it says, there's various categories. Uh, the first one, you kind of outline a little about yourself, then position, the position that you're applying for or have held, then sources of income. And then it says business or professional activity categories. And under that, it says business or professional activity categories. And you put agriculture and forestry support, ag support activities. And then under engaged as an employee, that was one option. Engaged as a contractor was another option. You checked engaged as an employee. And That's what's on your form. And so I was just curious what that was about. And, and uh, Mr. Vats, just, just to help uh, bring any clarity, I think uh, Senator Dames is looking through the, we've provided 
packets for everybody on the committee. The economic interest form uh, that was that was completed and is public record. We've we've provided that for all the people we've heard about today, and I think that's the form. If that helps helps you uh, know where he's asking, where Mr. he's reading. Chair. From. Senator Dames. Yes, it is the statement of economic interest for a public official form that you hit put in when you applied for the position to serve on the board. Okay, and so so and I'm Mr. not I'm not saying you did anything wrong. I'm just asking for an explanation, and and obviously if you don't recall it, you don't recall it, and uh, you know. So I mean, if you want to look that up and see see what that's about, you certainly can do that. I was just asking because that's what's on the form that you ultimately sent in and would have signed off on. And so Thank Mr. Batts, does that help uh, help you at all uh, clarify the question? Thank you for bringing that up. The email that I got from Joel Hampson uh, on that email, that information that you're talking about is listed on there. I reviewed that this morning. I don't remember that question, but I will go back there. Mm -hmm. The last time I was an employee is when I was a vocational agriculture instructor in 1967. I have not worked, I have not collected a 1099 since then from any other employer. So I've been self-employed for 60 years, uh, 55 years. If I answered that incorrectly, it was a mistake, I apologize. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vatz, and uh, uh, I guess if you want to look at that a little closer and uh, follow up with us on our committee, uh, that would be helpful as well. And uh, uh, Joel Hansen is our committee administrator, who I you, you referenced there, but he's been you've been working with setting the agenda and getting everybody lined up. So that that'd be great. Uh, other questions, members? Senator French, uh, did did. Did that cut you off short or early? Not at all, Mr. Chair. I think okay. we got the information we needed. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions, members? Doesn't look like it further, uh, any further, Mr. Vats. And uh, uh, we do thank you for taking the time to join us, uh, getting to know you a little better uh, as part of our committee's uh, duties and obligations. And we uh, sure uh, have learned a lot about many great members that we've got on the Board of Animal Health. And uh, members, I hope this was insightful for all of you. It sure was for me. Uh, as we uh, take this uh, delegated authority under the Constitution very seriously. And so uh, uh, I think it's been well worth our time. So Mr. Vatz, uh, no further questions. Uh, thank you again for your participation. Thank you for joining us and uh, taking time out of your schedule as well. Uh, you have a great rest of the day and um, members with that, uh, that concludes our agenda. The committee meeting is adjourned.